I think we'll get we'll begin I think with our um, with our first presentation so welcome everybody to the first of our panels for the symposium um, and I'm going to introduce you to our presenters um, and after and then I'll ask each presenter to give a five minute recap of their video presentations um, and I'd just like to say that all the video presentations for the symposium are up on our multiple our more just futures YouTube channel um, and we'll put the link into the chat so that um, you can uh, uh, connect to the uh, video presentations and you can watch those um, and then after the presentation recaps our presenters will have a conversation together about their practice research um, and we will also have time for questions too so as Flounder mentioned please um, put your questions in the chat or raise your hand if you would like to ask a question um, so uh, I'd first like to introduce uh, Karini Aguiar de Souza Sonier, uh, who is a recording artist and researcher born and raised in the city of Manaus, which is nested in the heart of the Brazilian Amazon rainforest. Um, Karini has a master's in environmental sciences and sustainability uh, in the Amazon from the Universidad Federal do Amazonas and is now a PhD candidate at Universidad de Campinas, um, where she is developing a research project with Amazonian ecomusicologies under Suzelle and O'Reilly's supervision uh, and funded by Capice. Um, and I wonder, Karine, if you would uh, like to give us a five minute um, recap of your presentation. Thank you, Kate. Thank you for this beautiful presentation. Uh, good morning and good, good afternoon, everybody. It's such a great honor to be here today among these wonderful proposals. I would like to thank to the organizers for, of the symposium at the University of Plymouth uh, for the opportunity to talk about this project, which is not only so important to me, but it is even more important for the collaborator community and its talented artists that have been fighting for more just and more sustainable future through their artistic expressions. I must tell you, they are right now following us in this live streaming on Facebook, and I ask your permission to send them a greeting in Portuguese once most of them do not speak English. Can I? <laughs> okay. Please do. Bon yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Bom dia, Mauéis. Um bom dia e o meu muito obrigada à equipe da Aliança Guaraná de Mauéis e ao Idesan pelo apoio nessa transmissão. Obrigada, Silvana, por proporcionar a participação da comunidade local nesse momento. E uma saudação muito especial aos meus amigos de Santa Maria do Mauéis a Sul, que hoje estão aqui mostrando sua música e sua cultura para o mundo. É uma honra enorme poder embarcar nessa aventura com vocês. Thanks a lot to the English speaker audience for allowing me to send this greeting to my friends in Maués. And now we should come back to, to my proposal. Tapira Yawara is an enchanted being described in the cosmologies of native Panamazonian peoples since immemorial times. The name comes from the sum of two words in Tupi. Tapir has the equivalent meaning for tapirus terrestris and yawara, the equivalent meaning for jaguar. It is portrayed as a kind of water jaguar or amphibious jaguar that lives near ponds, lakes, anigais, and streams. Camara Cascudo presents the word Tapira Yawara to describe a fabulous animal for shellfish gatherers of the Madeira River and tributaries of the Amazon. Tapira Yawara is in Amazonian culture is the equivalent of a chimera for the Greeks. And the 20, in the first decade of the 21st century, um, this ancient Amazonian mythical figure gave rise to the dance of Tapira Yawara a June reverie created in the village of Santa Maria do Maués Azul, located on the right bank of the Maués Azul River, 
approximately 37 and a half miles by river from the municipality of Maués and the state of the Amazonas in northern Brazil. As a tradition consolidated during the June festivities, it has also been presented at environmental education and environmental conservation events. Given the many intertwinings of this tradition with ecological issues, I chose to carry out an eco-criticism about its musicing, relying on eco-musicology as the interface of music sound and environmental ecological studies, according to Aaron Allen and Kevin Daw. The choice for the notion of music, music in, in Torino is justified by the various forms of engagement with music in Santa Maria do Maués Azul and the surrounding villages, making musical instruments, creating an exclusively authorial musical repertoire, presentations with the participation of young people from the village, decoration of the presentation arena, creation of scenarios with elements found in the forest and the reuse of plastic waste that accumulates in the community to make costumes and decorations. By musicking, the inhabitants of Santa Maria do Maués Azul and surrounding villages not only have fun or support their cultures, but they learn from each other the sense of pertaining the environment in which they live and its importance for the maintenance of their own lives. Thank you. Thank you, Karini, for that um, overview of your research presentation. That's wonderful. Um, I'd like to move now to uh, Isaiah um, and give a brief introduction. Uh, welcome, Isaiah. Isaiah Green is a PhD student in ethnomusicology at Indiana University, where he also currently serves as a graduate assistant for the Diverse Environmentalism's research team. His research focuses on musical expression in pagan spiritual practices and their connections to the environment. He has presented on ecomusicology at the annual meeting of the American Musicological Society and the Music of the Sea Symposium in Mystic, Connecticut and will present at the National Meeting of the Society of Ethnomusicology in October of 2021. He is currently conducting fieldwork with pagan musicians and historical research on witchcraft in North America. And um, Isaiah, if you would please give us your five minute recap of your uh, video presentation. Yeah, hello everyone. It's nice to see you. Um, I'm coming to you from Bloomington, Indiana. It's starting to finally get cold, which I like. I'm from the mountains, so it's nice for me. Um, so for my video presentation, I took a little bit of a different approach and tried to do a short documentary. So you may have noticed that I didn't talk a lot. Um, I worked with one of my closer collaborators that's a pagan musician. Her name is uh, Maven Stone. Um, she is a pagan and often considers herself as one on a druid path. Um, and so a lot of my work here is uh, trying to look at the different ways that belief situates people's understandings of environmental problems that we're facing right now and the eco crisis that we are all in and how it kind of formulates their local responses to it, um, especially through musical means. So when it came to paganism, I actually had an encounter um, not that long ago at the AMS meeting. I uh, the AMS meeting in 2019 was actually in Boston, and uh, I decided to skip part of the conference, which shame on me, I guess, but I skipped part of the conference to go to Salem, Massachusetts, because it was Halloween. So I was curious as to what was kind of going on there. And while I was there, I actually saw environmental protests um, happening and conflict between uh, two religious groups. And that's kind of where my interest started in all of this. Um, so after that, I began kind of looking to different people, wondering what was going on. Um, and I kind of started taking on looking into more popular conceptions of what paganism is and more uh, community understandings of what paganism is for those who are actual practitioners of this uh, belief or spirituality based in conjure. Um, one of the quotes that I kind of 
went on to continue to think about was from uh, folklorist Sabina Magliocco, who is a kind of expert in this area. Um, she described paganism as, quote, uh, they believe that as humans became more attached from nature, they ceased to see it as sacred. It is this sense of the numinous, the magical, the sacred in nature, and in the human form that their religions attempt to recapture. So it's this, um, paganism is this uh, group of people trying to reconnect to the land through uh, ancient or not so ancient um, uh, beliefs about nature and spiritual conceptions. Um, I grew interested in this for multiple reasons and I, and I worked and I kind of found my way to Maven. Um, who is a harpist. And I began to talk with her a lot more about how she felt her music worked in spiritual terms. And an interesting term kept coming up every time we talked, which is sustainability. And I know we've all heard this term and it has its own different uses in different places, but it was interesting to me that this was the term that she kept using, especially since it was one that I have encountered multiple times in my own research in eco-musicology and cultural sustainability. Um, and so I kind of hung on to that word of, well, what does she mean by sustainability? Um, what does that term even mean? And so I decided to do this documentary with her, this short documentary about what sustainability meant for her. Um, and in the case of this community that she's living in, this intentional community, it's a multiplicity of things. It's, you know, harvesting their own vegetables. It's planting trees and letting the land kind of grow back over itself, this um, kind of wild nature kind of idea that they have. And, and, and then in other cases, it's a very spiritual one. Um, being a place to take her instrument out into the woods and play and feel connected to the land and feel a space that's not violent for once. Um, those kinds of things. And so that's mostly where my interest took place is uh, in wanting to do this presentation is showing how pagan musicians specifically are using their music as a way to um, combat historical violences that have taken place that have led to their kind of belief system as they have it today. That's great. Thank you, Isaiah. Thank you. Um, and now um, I'd like to introduce our third uh, panelist, who's Laura Magnuson. Um, Laura is a queer Canadian Hi, Laura. <laughs> Laura is a queer Canadian artist and filmmaker with a focus on video, sculpture, performance and underwater research creation. She is currently pursuing a PhD in interdisciplinary humanities at Concordia University in Montreal, Quebec, researching the capacity of multimodal art forms to elucidate felt experiences of trauma resulting from sexual violence. She holds an MFA in Interdisciplinary Art from Penny W. Stamps School of Art and Design at the University of Michigan and a BFA from the School of Art at the University of Manitoba, where she, was a, where she has a permanent public sculpture on display. And um, Laura, if I can invite you now to um, tell us your five minute uh, recap of your video presentation, please. Okay, thank you, Kate. Um, hi, welcome to our panel and uh, so my name is Laura and I'm a white uh, female and I'm sitting um, in front of a faux brick wall on a red couch. And I'm joining you today as a guest on the unceded indigenous lands of Chichoque, um, also known as Montreal, which is a historical gathering place for many First Nations, including the Ganyagahaga Nation. Um, my video presentation was on the creation of my short film, Blue, which um, I'm going to share my screen now, um, if I can. And um, let's see, one moment, please. Are you able to see my screen? Okay. I'm just going to see you present. Okay. Um, 
Uh, and I just, uh, my short film Blue deals with um, my survival of sexual violence. There won't be any explicit imagery or descriptions, but I just want to invite you to take the space that you need. Um, I'll play um, a clip um, of the film as I speak. So um, Blue is a 12 minute um, silent film shot entirely underwater, 70 feet beneath the surface of Cozumel, Mexico. Um, cinematography is by Guy Chomet of Liquid Motion Film and uh, production assistance was provided by Pelagic Ventures Scuba. Alone on an ocean tundra wearing a protective clamshell like parka and winter boots, I arduously move, exhale and burrow through the afterlife of sexual violence. The medium of water with its destructive potential and capacity to heal, um, in addition to the weight of an air tank with its promise of survival and threat of impending emptiness, hold the fullness of traumatic experience. In the silent psychic landscape, I bear witness to the complex nature of trauma and the ongoing process of healing. Blue is autobiographical. It's a response to my own struggles against barriers to articulating my story, uh, my own story on and in my own terms. Um, the pursuit of objective justice often is on evidence and factual truth to the exclusion of felt experience. It's the impact, this uh, film is the impact statement I was not permitted to give before the law by means of somatic expression, visual metaphor and editing strategies. It seeks to give form to my subjective experience, psychological and emotional impacts and how they are registered in my body. Um, art can elucidate felt experiences of trauma in visual embodied ways that are not possible through spoken and written language alone. And I'm interested in how artists make use of their own bodies or embodiment more broadly to make visible, internal, often invisible, lived realities of violence um, and survival. My somatic expression underwater was not predetermined. I did not make and execute a shot list. Rather, possibilities for movement, actions, and gestures were explored and developed on site. Water is my collaborator, a nurturing and threatening force, supportive, receptive, restrictive, and different a continuation of myself psychologically and materially. The ocean of blue is inspired by the frigid otherworldly depths of northern waters. In my video presentation, I discuss how the violence perpetrated against me occurred near water in a northern community located at the juncture of marine and tundra biomes. Echoes of this environment are woven throughout blue, the sandy snowy expanse, my parka, my winter boots, the dollhouse I carry is a 124th scale replica of the site of the violence, the Iceberg Inn, which I sculpted from personal documentation. A little 3D figurine, um, printed figurine of myself is fixed in the doorway. In making this work, I was guided by the figure of a clam. I thought a lot about a particular clam of the species Arctica Islandica, Hafrun, who was dredged from the waters of North Iceland in 2006. At the time of her death by dredging dissection, she was 507 years old. Hafrun, which means mystery of the ocean, has become a kind of kin with whom to think through violence and its many interconnected forms, as well as the limits of forensic evidentiary pursuits of knowledge. What do we know of this near mythic creature? Um, just bring this picture of here, here. What do we know of this near mythic creature archived as WG061294R? I wonder about the ineffable dimensions of her sprawling life. Um, and just to, to wrap up here, um, something I'm thinking about um, as I recall these Northern waters um, in, in the work is um, how does Cozumel, Mexico figure into this work? Um, this is a picture of Fernando, um, one of my uh, collaborators who supported the production of, um, of Blue. Um, we're doing a shore dive test here. Um, so am I displacing or erasing the specific histories of this place um, in my presentation of it um, in, a, in a kind of nor um, the sort of northern motifs that I'm um, using? And, what are my responsibilities um, to the waters of Cozumel that I work with in blue and to the people 
and communities whose histories, presence, and futures are part of and inseparable from these waters. Well, thank you, I'll leave it at that and stop sharing my screen. I can. Okay. Um, all right, one moment, I've kind of lost the, uh, oh, here we go. Um, stop share. Thank you. Okay. Lovely. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, Karin and Isaiah, Karini and Isaiah. And um, so I'd like to invite you all to uh, into conversation now um, about your own research and about your thoughts about each other's research too. Um, and I wonder if anyone has an initial response that they'd like to give. Can I start? Please do, Karini. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you to you two for this wonderful project. Uh, Laura, I was really, really touched by your movie and by your perspective. I think you were a really brave woman to bring this out. And it, it, it's, it's really, really moving and beautiful. The, the, the images underwater and, and the, the images in, at night with the fish sparkling, beautiful, beautiful choices. Thank you so much. And I, I see the, this issue of sexual abuse as uh, a, a, a severe problem ecological problem of sustainability because our sexist vision uh, of nature, nature as a female organism uh, gives, gives us to, um, the right to aggress, the right to, uh, to damage. And I think this is a, 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 a reflex of how society see uh, women and your beautiful collaboration with the water, which is also a great, uh, uh, one of the greatest collaboration in my research. Once water is the, <laughs> is the place uh, where my collaborators and I used to, to move from, from a community to another, and we are always in the river. And this, this really beautiful in common with my research, uh, I really appreciate. And Isaiah, wow, what a what a great um, what a great artist is Mavy. And I loved her music. I loved the way uh, she lives. She lives uh, in a very similar way um, of my collaborators. They also live in a small community where they try to have a sustainable life planting their own food. Sometimes it's not possible because they have severe uh, times uh, with a cycle of the water that comes up and comes down. And so sometimes the feeding gets difficult. And it, it also brought me to, to my research, uh, the, this, this relationship with the, 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 the uh, planting their own food and also the paganism I think um, in the Amazon, uh, this, this communities that make music uh, inside the forest, they also have a very colorful faith, a very colorful way to see the divine, the sacred. And most of this color comes from the paganism. Uh, we used to call this, um, most of the communities I'm working with are Catholic communities, but they are non-traditional Catholic. They have many uh, connections with this, this pagan religious that we used to call indigenous religious. And so they, they believe uh, in Jesus, in the Virgin Mary, in the saints of June reveries, and also in the Encantados, which are these enchanted uh, myth mythic beings from the forest, such as Tapirayawara, such as um, um, Kurupira, and 
something like that. And this many figures that, that appear in Brazilian folklore. Uh, I, I don't like this word folklore. I think it's really problematic, but um, because these figures uh, are not um, properly mythic. They believe, they believe in, in these beings. They believe these beings protect the forest. They believe these beings have some agency in the material life. And so thank you. <laughs> thank you, uh, you both for this beautiful researchers. And I see we have a lot, a lot to talk. We have a lot in common. And I hope we can collaborate, collaborate with each other in uh, very soon <laughs> in the future. Thank, thank you uh, so much, uh, Karini, for that very warm opening for us. Um, it's so nice to be in conversation with you both, uh, Karini and Isaiah. And um, I also feel honored um, to be in this space with people who consider music, um, especially in the context of my film being silent. Um, and so there's kind of an interesting um, pairing there. Um, and maybe um, something that I just to just to think about maybe um, uh, things that maybe a common thing that came to me from both of your presentations was this idea, um, which I found so fascinating was the descriptions um, of the instrumentation of the musicians. Um, coming from nature, and so for and and Karini, is it the um, are are the um, your collaborators are are lots of them um, fishermen as well with the uh... yes the singer the main singer is a fisherman and yes. he's 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 also the songwriter and his songs are are properly. Uh, uh, a beautiful picture and an image he 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 does of the his surrounding environment, and so he gets inspired inspired on fisheries. He gets inspired for the trees and and the, the environmental the environmental issues in general. And the yeah. other the other the other two guys, um, the elderly man playing the banjo, he's uh actually all, all of them they used to fish because they they live by the river but uh the 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 main singer is is a professional uh fisher fisherman and the guy the other guy uh, the other elderly man playing the percussion is uh, like a sorcerer he oh. <laughs> it, it's wonderful. He has a wonderful uh, work, and I will, I will be showing um, his his work uh, in my PhD thesis uh, because this is only a sl small part. Uh, this this uh, this project, this text, this work I'm presenting here now is a, a little cut of my of the whole thing I'm I'm thinking about in my thesis. And we have musicians that are sorcerers, fishermen, and they work with agriculture and they ride boats. They have uh, uh, deep uh, skills with orientation in the, in the water and with the sky and for the trees. And it's very interesting. My, my favorite part of your um, video presentation was um, well, one of them was um, the description of um, how the banjo was made and um, how the musician made his banjo. And I loved this idea of recycle. First of all, it's so innovative and the idea of recycling the materials to create it. But then also the connection of the nylon strings being the same, you know, the fishing lines and mm -hmm. thinking about building those connections between maybe the sites of influence um, or inspiration and then it, like into the materiality of the music making. And um, it reminded me too, Isaiah, of um, thinking about Maven's uh, beautiful description of, uh, in, in your video presentation of 
bringing um, her harp outside and she's talking about the um, having done maybe a more uh, traditional training on the harp, a more classical um, approach to it where maybe she was performing in more confined spaces, more controlled spaces. And then she brings her harp outside and she hears the wind go through and activate the harp in a particular way. And then describing how the wood um, of the harp is from the forest and how the strings themselves are the sinews of animals. And so, yeah, I found I found that really compelling. And I was wondering, because it seems like you're working with lots of different musicians, and I'm wondering if the other musicians that you're working with um, are also working in natural environments and have that kind of relationship to their to their instruments. Yeah, it depends on the group. So, um, but yeah, a lot of them do. So one of them um, who I've started to get in contact with, Dom the Bard. Uh, some of you may have heard of Dom the Bard. I don't know. He's pretty famous in some circles for like, um, I'm trying to think of the right term, but like kind of folk revivalist music is what he does. But he's very into the like recycled instruments, using instruments made by nature, from nature kind of deal. Um, and then there are some that are a little bit of both. So there's one group that I work with um, who's very interesting. Um, they're called, they're, the band name is Tuatha D. Um, they're actually from my like home area. They're from Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Um, but they are a pagan band that is like, they have, uh, they have like harps, flutes, drums all those kinds of things but they also use electric guitar so they're kind of a celtic bluegrass rock fusion group it's really odd wow. um but their music amazing. amazing but the, the interesting thing for them is when you go to uh, pagan music festivals and there are, are quite a few of them actually that are very large when they go to these festivals they kind of stand out because of that because a lot of these, a lot of the pagan musicians are using some of these more like, um, like harp, like traditional instruments that are made a little bit more directly from natural sources. And then here comes Tuatha Dee and you hear just blaring electric guitar. Um, but they're also interesting because they use some very strange techniques. Like they use uh, pieces of bark as picks. They'll uh, tie grass into the strings. They have you know, like little environmental justice stickers all over the instrument. So it's still very much there for them, but it's an interesting one where um, the electric guitar actually for them has become a center of debate where people in the pagan community yeah. really want to hear these like Renaissance fantasy nature instruments. And then there are some groups who are like, no, I want pagan metal. So um, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's an odd kind of friction but yeah the use of like the land and trying to cultivate the land into the sound somehow and into the even materiality of the instrument is certainly there for many of them um and she didn't I don't know if I put this in the documentary but you may remember she talked about the flower crown um uh, and yes. making the I flower remember. crowns for certain specific sabbats and stuff and um actually we're in Maybon which is one of the sabbats right now um, so she's probably out doing that this morning, collecting some vines for uh, making the flower crowns. But um, she didn't talk about it much that day. But one of the things they also do is, um, depending on what Sabbath it is, I know that a lot of musicians will also go collect items for their instruments as well. Um, so they will go out and make creating the instrument or um, getting, you know, you like, tools or devices that help the instrument produce sound as part of the ritual and so they bless these specific items and so that there's a spiritual blessing on it to make it make a more sacred music I guess um so yeah it's very much tied to what they're doing wow. yes yeah, speaking about uh the groups I'm working with I work with four groups and Tapira Yawara dance is one of these four groups and actually, there are four groups that support each other because they live in small villages in the middle of the forest. And these villages are like neighbor villages, but <laughs> they are also very distant. Um, and uh, the instruments are, are made 
are all made with uh, things collected in the forest or things that uh, would be um, would be thrown away in the in the trash. And um, uh, Mestre Racito is that elderly man that makes the banjo. He he also knows how to make drums and. He, he, he makes, and he, he's a composer and he, he makes a lot of musical instruments. And he, he comes from a, an ancestrality of very old masters of uh, oral tradition. And he learned this, um, this way of, of making things with his, his father and his, his grandfather. And, uh, Iracito is like um, the official uh, uh, luthier instrument maker for all these musicians, but there are also other musicians that share this, this knowledge of making instruments. And uh, by making drums, for example, they, they do not cut a tree for making a low drum. Uh, they, they walk in the forest, uh, they search for this tree, which is already fallen in the forest, and they take that. They, they take it and they 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 uh, they make the drum the, the drums, and they use they use uh, um, animal skins. Before they used to use animal skins from from the forest, but now uh, with the reduction of biodiversity and many environmental problems in the region. They are using uh, cow skin. Uh, sometimes they, uh, at any times, they 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 kill a bull or a cow for uh, a feast, a traditional feast, and they use the skin to make the instruments. And they are now also working on some more sustainable uh, options um, with skins made of plants uh, like rubber. And they are also trying to use um, other, other types of materials, um, uh, for example, like um, uh, plastic, the, that pla the plastic uh, big uh, drums that they use to, to, to keep things. And now they are using this big plastic low drums for, for doing these musical instruments. For not using instead of using the wood, and they are they are always experiencing. Uh, I must say, uh, these musicians uh, together they 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 are always experiencing a lot of things. They are like a, a a huge laboratory, musical laboratory in the middle of the forest, and so uh, they are very very tied with nature because they also express their values of reuse, reduce, recycle, uh, doing these materials, the, doing these this, um, musical instruments from these this reusable materials and trying, trying also to protect their environment from garbage and from uh, other environmental damage, damages ca caused, by, caused by the plastic and something like this. I have a question um, for you, Karini. Um, um, maybe a kind of twofold question there, because there's um, something, maybe threefold. There's something that I, there's something that really struck me in your presentation about the first decade of the 21st century, seeing this revival of interest or expression around uh, tapi Tapirayawara. Tapira Yawara. Tapia, yawara. Uh, my apologies for my pronunciation. No. Um, okay. But and I'm wondering um, if if that if that like um, if that revival and the kind of um, the sort of moral under underpinnings of that story uh, or of that um, kind of um, interest in that being um, being correlated to environmental crisis that's happening, um, and maybe the more felt experience of it by the community. And I'm also interested in, um, maybe divisions of gender as well, because I noticed at least a lot of the musicians, um, seemed to be, um, male to me. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you talk about the, um, 
the community participating in um, the uh, the dance. And I'm just wondering if there's if um, like if the whole community participates in this music making um, and what that kind of looks like. Okay, uh, the first point. Uh, yes, Tapira Yawara dance is a, I would consider this as a music revival experience. Uh, actually, it started at least uh, 30 or 20 years before this revival, it was, it was, um, this dance was made by other members of communities and they, they stopped presenting the dance. And this young guy uh, called Dayo, uh, when he was a, a little boy, he used to see this, he used to watch these presentations and he decided to make this revival. And so he created that, 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 um, how can I how can I say this? That big that 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 big being like a dragon, like a Chinese dragon. The, the sculptural uh, performance. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sorry about my English. <laughs> and uh, he started to he he decided to do this revival, but before this tapira yawara dance, um, uh, they there there wasn't not music in that. By this revival, they added this uh, musical dimension with uh, Mestre Silio, which is uh, who is the, the the main singer and the composer of, of all these songs, and and yes, uh, I think this idea of the environmental crisis uh, is really tied, is deeply connected to to this to this uh, dance, to this artistic, um, to this artistic product they, they created because uh, when I was talking to them during uh, field research and, and now, and, and we have always been talking <laughs> uh, once we are collaborators and they, they told me about some uh, issues with uh, loggers and gold mining and like irregular fishery. And um, they, they told me they are going through some serious problems in that, in that region, but not specifically in, that, in, in, those, in, in their community. The, they told me the neighbor communities, the surrounding communities are, are being really damaged with this, this um, ecological problems in the Amazon. And right now, uh, more specifically, these, these ecological uh, problems are increasing, have increased a lot with our new president who hates environmentalists. <laughs> and um, it's, it's the, the situation there is getting really severe, uh, more and more severe. And the third uh, question about gender, yes, uh, most of the musicians are, are men because this is, I think this is also part of a sexist uh, tradition in the Amazon uh, because in, in old times, men used to play the instruments and it was like something uh, that was not allowed for, for women. And, but now uh, uh, three of these four groups I'm working with are allowing women to play, to sing, um, and to participate of this music making more actively as, as musicians, as singers, as, uh, you know, as performers. And, uh, about the participation of community, yes, I use this idea of musicking because the whole communities in this uh, that surrounds where they where these groups live, they they participate in uh, directly in the performance, but also indirectly. They support the musicians. They work on decorations. They 
they work on uh, setting up the plays for the presentations. That's why I use the idea of music in, in Torino because I consider all these things as part of the musical engagement. Because if this if if the community doesn't collaborate to make the this presentation, this music happen, it, it really doesn't happen. So it's a very uh, communitary practice. The communities are are proud of this of these musicians. They are proud of this these reveries, and so everybody gets involved to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. You know, something that I kind of noticed that was a um, similar thread between some of, I think less mine, but both uh, yours, Karine and Laura, also yours, uh, that was super interesting was this concept of agency that kind of is underlying in all of it, and especially non-human agencies. Um, uh, and Karine with yours, the, with the Tapira Yawara, right? But it's, it's, it's this kind of like mythical um, spirit kind of connected to these practices, but also it does have some form of agency and especially in that sculptural kind of display, it becomes very much having its own agency. And then the water and yours, Laura, I thought that was so interesting, just this kind of like water so interesting to me. We often think of it as having agency and power and all of these things, um, unlike other inanimate kind of uh, things in the natural world. So I don't know. I just thought that that was super interesting, a, a connection between all, all of these presentations. And another one, Laura, I really uh, loved the part of your presentation on healing. So I actually am doing like a lot of work on healing as well, because it's a big part of Conjure. But yours was so interesting because I loved how you challenged the notion that it's this process of trauma, justice, healing, and it's very like a specific order when really that's not what happens for a lot of people. And um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit uh, more about how people like how these notions of healing are kind of constructed as um, something that needs to be fixed or that it's this process that happens in a very specific order when really it's something a little more ongoing and throughout life. Oh, thank you so much, Isaiah. That's, um, that's really, um, thank you for for not noticing and articulating and inviting that question. Um, yeah, I, that, so that's something that, um, yeah, that's definitely something I was um, thinking about um, is that it's like, wh what does, what does healing look like? And um, thinking about, yeah, you were mentioning this, this kind of um, construct um, of, you know, maybe maybe this idea that before a trauma you are somehow whole and then a trauma ruptures wholeness and then and then healing or recovery becomes this process it, like it configured as linear that you're just going to kind of move through these stages and then you know become whole again and that's really not how <laughs> a lot of people experience um trauma and so i'm i'm really um uh, not so much in blue itself, which um, my film was was really um, at that point in, in my practice, I was really thinking about how I could articulate what was happening in my body um, um, and being in this underwater setting and kind of moving against and with the water as being a way to elucidate something of what I was experiencing of my um, of the afterlife of um, sexual violence. But what I'm interested in thinking about now is um, is less maybe the um, the maybe psychological impacts of trauma, some of the ways that I was cutting the film suggest a kind of dissociative state. Um, I'm less interested in kind of a pathologizing of that and more interested in thinking about what trauma can um, teach us and how trauma like reconfigures our relationships with the world and with ourself and um, and so blue doesn't necessarily that wasn't the project of blue but it has been something that through making blue i've um been thinking about and um so the experience uh one i wanted to add one more thing what was it um yeah maybe i'll leave it there for the moment and if my other thought <laughs> surfaces i will chime in <laughs> 
uh, I'd just like to thank everybody there for that very, very rich um, conversation that you had. And I, I just would, the points that you've raised and some of the things that you said, they're so um, interesting and evocative that I would really like us to have a chance for um, wider questions. Uh, so from uh, um, wider questions for the audience. So um, if you don't mind, um, I'd like to see if we have any um, questions, if anybody would like to ask themselves or raise a hand or um, if you don't want to ask a question yourself, just pop it in the chat and I can ask it for you. Um, but uh, would anyone like to start with a question for um, the panel or for anybody on the panel? Well, I mean, I'd like to start with a question myself, actually, <laughs> to jump in. And, and Laura, it, it follows on from what you were just um, speaking about, and Isaiah, what you were just um, um, asking Laura about as well, your your um, great question that you put to Laura. And I was really um, moved by your careful um, use of language, uh, evoking trauma and violence. And um, amongst other moments, I was thinking of the particular way that you describe the preparation and dissection of Havron and, uh, and the, the just the evocative, but still very gentle, like an antithesis of violence in your language, which I found really moving. and. Um, at the end of your presentation, you ask how we as um, artists and researchers can centre care. Um, and I wonder if you could comment a little further on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something it's, I don't, um, it's something that I'm thinking about. And there's, um, I think actually this is like when we see um, your panel, Kate, and with Nick as well, um, I think that both of you talk a lot about this, um, this um, care, um, something about, so I, I worry, I've, I've been involved in projects in the past that seem exploitative or extractive. I was involved in this, um, and, and almost colonial, um, and I was involved in this site-specific project in, Church, in Churchill, Manitoba, which is the, the site of the, the violence that I experienced. And I was working on a project to try to connect with beluga whales through sound mm -hmm. and dance-like canoe movement on the water. And we were young and we didn't know a lot about the community or the place. And we you know, went on a train for 48 hours and ended up getting dropped off there. And then we were on the river doing our thing and our interactions were really divorced from any kind of thinking about the like um, community that we were working in. Um, we, I ended up leaving that project for a lot of ethical concerns that weren't being um, raised in the project itself um, with my collaborative team. But one of them was like, um, I wanted for us to stay still on the canoe and not move and have the whales come to us if they wanted to. But my collaborators were really invested in this idea of this documentary we were making and getting cool shots of the whales. And oh. so I, I bring this up as kind of something that I've been thinking about in my practice for a long time, because here I am in, in Cozumel, Mexico, again, I'm in a, I'm in a new environment. And you know, my research has taken me to Iceland to go see the waters where half green was dredged. And so as a, as a researcher, I'm, I'm really thinking about like, what, like, uh, what is this about going into other environments and how, like, how do we do so in a way that it seems necessarily ex like a kind of extractive act, even mm -hmm. though I have friends in Cozumel, I have community, I've been there multiple times. I did all of my dive training there. I, you know, it doesn't feel like enough. And well, as an art piece in and of itself, I don't think that it needs to be about Cozumel because it was shot in Cozumel, but there needs to be something more happening than what was happening in terms of acknowledging the spe specificity of the waters that I'm working in and, um, and those histories. And it means some, like, I, I can't, I don't want to piecemeal and compartmentalize um, 
that space in the same way that I felt piecemealed and compartmentalized by the legal system, for example, mm. only wanting a specific dimension of my experience. And mm. so I'm really interested if anyone has thoughts on um, on how to approach that or or maybe uh, Karini and Isaiah, how how this this these questions maybe figure in your work as well. Just waiting to see whether um, Karini or Isaiah, you have a, a thought about that for Laura or... Um... I don't have an answer, but this is something that comes up in my work a lot, especially with pagan communities um, who are practicing uh, their beliefs on stolen land. And they're trying to connect to a land that they don't belong to, but they want to be with. So there's this very detached sense of what it means to belong and what it means to be with. Um, and these kinds of things, and this, this comes up a lot um, in my research in terms of what, is, what does it mean to take care when working with these communities spiritually? Um, and what does it mean when they work with a land that they don't belong to? Um, I don't have an answer for that, but that's often a question that comes up not only from me, but also with my collaborators, they think about this a lot too. And especially when um, I also do research, not on these traditional pagan communities, but also on very white nationalist ones and trying mm -hmm. to expose the violences that they uh, kind of commit. Um, and that's what my presentation will be on at SEM. But I don't know if any of you remembered the Capitol riots that happened here in the US, but there was a pagan who was there that considers himself a pagan musician shaman and he is pretty much claims to be a Navajo shaman and he's not um but there's like a serious theft that goes on there but he is a part of the same community that I'm researching so there's an interesting kind of divergence there between even people within this one group about what it means to care and what they feel the right to have land is what their right to the land is um, and it can be very problematic at times. And then at other times, it's extremely complicated. Yeah. Yeah, this, this feeling of pertaining to a land is something really strong uh, uh, among the groups I'm working with, because uh, their music and their musicking is also uh, uh, a way they try to become uh, visible. These this people were during their whole lives and his ancestors and their ancestors were invisible in the middle of the forest. And uh, uh, they live every day um, very serious issues with racism uh, when they go to, to, um, to the urban area uh, and uh, there, there is this kind of feeling of non be, non belong, not belonging there in the urban, urban area, but when they are in their communities, uh, this, this sense of pertaining is, very, is really, really deep, and they express this uh, in their songs, and they express this also in the way they make the, in the instruments, because there is also um, this sense of caring uh, with when they make the when they're making the, their instruments, and uh, well, I don't know. It this is something uh, to think uh, to deep uh, more and more a uh, kind of reflection to deep more and more in in my in, in the work with them. But they also use this sense of pertaining uh, and this caring for the territory to protect it and to justify um, everything they, they do and they think. And there's a very spirit, uh, very uh, deep spiritual connection with the land, with the nature, with the, the, the environment and the music. And so that's it. I, I hope, I, I don't know if I answered you. Yeah, Colette. Yeah. 
Um, I have a question for Laura, and it's slightly different than what we've been talking about, but it's um, a direct response from your presentation. And I was fascinated in your film when you were talking about your experience being on the, the bottom of the, the, the sea floor and that you were in a state of partial sensory deprivation and how what that experience was. And you were saying that for many women who um, have experienced trauma, that they have a very hard time accessing uh, sensory experience at all. Um, so because you did experience things, but it was so sort of unfamiliar and perhaps alien, um, I'm wondering if that opened up sort of new understandings and almost new knowings. And on the one hand, that might be going deeper into what happened to you, but it may also be a kind of a sensory information and knowing that assisted in your healing. Can you discuss your experience? Thank you, Colette. Yes, um, I'd love to touch on that briefly. I'm also conscientious of the time too, because I think we've got a couple more minutes. Um, so yeah. let's see how I do here. <laughs> but um, so something, yes, for me, I experienced feeling extremely disconnected from my body um, through trauma. And I still do at times. It's been a hard process to um, to inhabit my body again. And especially when I was learning to dive, it was really the traumas were quite fresh for me. And I noticed this amazing feeling of um, when you're diving, uh, you, you're responsible for your own body. So you need to check your air supply. You need to be always maintaining neutral buoyant, like trying to be maintain neutral buoyancy and making slight adjustments. And um, and then two, without being able to hear in the same way, and if you can imagine all of the pressure and the weight of water, diving becomes an incredibly embodied interior experience, at least for me. And so um, I felt like I could breathe almost better underwater because I was focusing on, on, I was so focused on my breath, so focused on taking it in. And I felt this, um, I felt held by the water in a kind of way and that the water was able to receive. Um, I, I did a visualization practice where I imagined kind of breathing some of the things I was experiencing into the water and the water being able to receive that. And so when I was on the seafloor um, and I'm not wearing goggles and I can't see and I, I can't hear anything. And so then it becomes um, a, a sort of environment where I can, again, think about my own embodiment. And um, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what I came to know through that experience. But I think what it offered me was a kind of potential that it was possible to access something uh, to to feel embodied, to feel in my own body. And um, and I think it was that experience that really led me to want to um, express um, my, my testimony, um, my felt experience of trauma in this context of, of working with and in response to water. Um, it felt like a natural kind of choice for me. Thank you. That was um, informative. I appreciate your uh, time on that. Thank you. So um, I'd like to thank everyone as well, Karini, Laura and Isaiah for a fantastic opening panel for our um, Multiple Ecology Symposium. And we've just coming to the end of our um, session now, but I think just a big round of applause for you three. You. Uh, it was fantastic. Thank you so much. And I, I hope you can stay with us and um, yeah, uh, and just um, stay and enjoy the event. And yeah, but thank you so much.